Oh. I hate, I hate him. What he did to me. Oh. I could kill him. I could kill him. If he was here right now, I'd kill him. I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. I got this poison. Yeah. I wonder why I've had this all this time. He hurt me so badly. I'll never forgive him. But I'll kill him. I'll kill him. That is what he deserves. He hurt me so badly, he needs to hurt. In fact, he needs to die. Yeah, just a little bit of this. Yeah. <laughs> I'll invite him over. We'll sit down and I'll act like nothing's wrong. Then I'll put this poison in his tea. That's what I'll do. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. Bitterness is a toxin that we prepare for someone else, but then we drink it ourselves. It is a concentrated dose of emotional poison, often one that we carefully nurture and grow over the course of years. When we react to someone's wrongdoing by withdrawing and giving free reign to daydreams, of retribution and ill will, we are slowly poisoning our own hearts and minds. Nelson Mandela, if you know his story, if anyone had a reason to be bitter and angry and be vengeful, he did. He was a South African, a black South African. And if you know about South Africa, when it was settled mostly by the Dutch and the Germans, they uh, instituted what was called apartheid, where the native black African people were subjected to slavery. Nelson Mandela was one of those. But he wanted to free his fellow black Africans from this tyranny and cruel punishment. It was, you know, it was cruel at times. So he started to peacefully demonstrate. He never provoked violence, although some Africans took it that far. He always tried to discourage that. But because he was a leader in that movement, the white rulers of that country put him in prison for over 20 years. If you know the history of South Africa, it was just 10, 15 years ago, apartheid ended. Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. Not only was he freed from prison, but the white government gave the arranged black government, the military, all the power that they once had. Up until that time, that's why many whites were fleeing South Africa, because they thought once apartheid came down, the blacks were going to be so angry that they were going to take it out on them. Nelson Mandela was the first black president. 
And instead of being vengeful, now that he had all the military at his disposal, he was the president. He could have ordered, in fact, many of his uh, people that were in power with him said, we should take vengeance. Look at what the whites did to us all these years. But no, he said, we must forgive them. We must forgive them. In fact, he said this. Resentment is like drinking poison, then hoping it will kill your enemies. Resentment is like drinking poison and hoping it will kill your enemies. Well, this is part two of our series. And uh, we're calling it The Downward Spiral of Destruction. From refusing to forgive those who hurt us, but also how to experience God's complete deliverance and healing. And we've talked about so far, and we will re-emphasize throughout this series, just how powerful this downward spiral is, but it all begins with pride. Pride. All sin comes from pride. And as we said last week, I truly believe that this issue of unforgiveness may be one of the most serious damaging, destructive responses. Way of thinking. We looked at that. It's a way of thinking. If indeed we refuse to forgive, it affects our mind. It affects our the way we view life and view people if we don't deal with it. The person who has been hurt Remember, we looked at much of the deep pain begins in childhood. Begins with abusive, either sexual, verbal, physical abuse, especially if it was a parent or parents, or lack of love. Maybe you had parents that didn't express their love to you, either by uh, words or actions. Instead, you're always screamed at, you're always yelled at. You are neglected and even abandoned. Maybe one or more of your parents just left or divorced. That's painful, especially for a child who does not have the maturity to process that pain. And so they internalize it. And we're going to look at what the result of that is this session. But what also happens is they begin to be bitter towards more than just those that have hurt them. And that's the terrible, terrible destruction aspect of this. Sin never sits still. If you don't deal with it in the right way, God's way, the biblical way, it always spreads and affects others. And of course we'll see that as we go on. Real quickly, uh, we looked at those painful memories. That's where it all begins, with pain, hurt. Then we looked at point two. What happens if we do not forgive? We develop what we call a spirit of unforgiveness, a spirit of unforgiveness, and that means a way of thinking, a way of life that permeates and affects every aspect of our life. And of course, this pain doesn't have to begin in childhood, it can begin even as adults. But most extreme anger and bitterness begins in children. That's what tests have proven both. Christian and secular. Now, it is at this point that if we do not learn to forgive, and there's only one 
solution to pain, to being offended, to being hurt, and is forgiveness, then we do develop a spirit of unforgiveness. Then, what happens next? Rather than quickly forgiving someone who hurts us and offends us, we instead choose, and again, we're going to emphasize that, it's always a choice, it's always a choice, we're going to choose not to forgive. We choose to hold a grudge. We choose to harbor, harbor vengeful thoughts. Again, this is pride rearing its ugly head, refusing to forgive. And then we start to cause scripture, what Jesus taught on, for instance, here in Matthew 6, to become a reality. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We're commanded in Ephesians 4.32, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And that's what our forgiveness of others is based on, what Jesus did for us. The fact that God has forgiven us of much more sin that we have hurt Him with than we've ever been hurt. Do you believe that? Yeah. 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 So if we can remember that, it, it helps us to be able to forgive others. And then we looked at that parable in Matthew 18, didn't we? The parable of the two debtors. One is forgiven of a huge debt, but then he refuses to forgive someone else of a minor debt. The actual amount of money was $50 million he was forgiven of, $50 million in our currency today, and he refused to forgive a fellow servant of only $40 debt. Jesus ends the parable by saying, and the Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors. We're going to look at that in detail today. What, what do these tormentors look like? Until he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts do not forgive everyone. So if you're under the sound of my voice and you've been sexually abused more than once, over and over again, Physically abused, verbally abused. God says, forget. No matter how severe the pain was. Because the alternative is what we're going to look at now. The alternative is just, well, destruction. So, what happens? We develop a spirit of bitterness. Now, unforgiveness and bitterness are very similar, and they really go hand in hand. In other words, where unforgiveness is, you have bitterness. And where you have bitterness, you have unforgiveness. Really, though, bitterness is a result or a consequence of unforgiveness. This is what Hebrews 12 tells us. We're instructed to follow peace with all people. Live at peace with all people. And this is a command, isn't it? And why do we have this command from God? Because if we do not allow, or if we do not forgive, or live at peace with even those that have hurt us, we allow, as it says here in Hebrews 12, a root of bitterness to spring up and trouble us. And many are defiled. Around our home we have weeds. And, uh, you know, there's different kinds of weeds, obviously. Some weeds are little weeds. Some weeds are big weeds. 
And as you know, if you try to pull some weeds, and if you just break them off at the surface, they'll grow back. It's because of their roots, isn't it? And with some weeds, the roots go very deep, depending on that type of plant. That's the illustration we have here. A root of bitterness. Springs up, it says. And troubles not only us, but defiles many around us. What are some evidences of being bitter? Here's just a few. Evidences of having a spirit of bitterness. A bitter person is easily offended and hurt, even about the littlest issue. A bitter person is an angry person, quick-tempered. You never know when they're going to explode. A bitter person, this is amazing in my counseling with people, a bitter person remembers past hurts and offenses easily, quickly, and in detail. I talk with people and they come to me with this issue and be a person in their 60s and they say, Daniel, I remember when I was a child in school and my classmates said I had big ears or a big nose or I was ugly or stupid. They still remember that. They can name the date, the names of the people that did it 60 years earlier. That's one thing to remember that. That's okay, but then they say, I still haven't forgiven them. I still am hurt by that. That's an evidence of the spirit of bitterness. A bitter person entertains vengeful thoughts against those who have hurt them in the past. Number five, a bitter person hates those who have hurt them in the past. Much more on this in weeks ahead. And then number six, a bitter person hates God. That's right. Because in the end, Ultimately, they know that God allowed it. God could have prevented that rape. God could have prevented that incest. God pr could have prevented that pain. He, he could have, right? That's true. So ultimately, the bitter person hates God. And I've heard people say that. F.B. Meyer says in his devotional, the person with a resentful heart takes just the opposite course of love. He grows every day harder and more acrimonious, which means bitter in all area of life. He defends his reputation, his rights, his ministry against his imagined foes. The worst feature about this whole thing is that it does no good to call attention to it. The bitter heart is not likely to recognize its own condition. The resentful man, in the meantime, will grow smaller and smaller, trying to get bigger and bigger. He will become more and more obscure, trying to become known. As he pushes on toward his selfish goal, his very prayers will be surely accusations against the Almighty. And his whole relationship toward other Christians will be one of suspicion and distrust. Evidences of the bitter spirit. So, Jesus said in Matthew 18, if we choose to not forgive those that have hurt us or offended us, he sends the tormentors. Hebrews, where we just looked at, uses the word trouble. It's the same idea of tormentors in Matthew 18. So notice, 
that unforgiveness and bitterness torments and troubles the person who has been hurt and refuses to forgive whoever has hurt them. Notice that not only is the person who is holding on to the unforgiveness and bitterness receives the torments and troubles, but through them many others are defiled. You, it's really valuable to look up these words in your study of Scripture, to look up individual words. And uh, defiled in the Greek literally means to pollute, to contaminate, or to soil. Bill Gothard says this, quote, major hindrances to the spiritual development of others may result when we refuse to forgive. Why? Because especially if we claim to be right with the Lord in a right relationship with Him, our attitudes of bitterness will repel them from whatever it is that we are trying to convince them of. If we are to allow Christ to live in us, we must allow Him to forgive through us. Unquote. How can this be illustrated? That is, the defilement of many around us if we are bitter. Well, family members that have to live with a bitter person. If you have to live with a bitter person, angry person, obviously you're going to be affected day to day. Whether it's physically, emotionally, or both, and even spiritually. Co-workers who have to work alongside someone who's bitter and angry every day. Mass murderers. Obviously we know what they can do. I.e. Charles Manson. You read about his writings and what he has said, his quotes. He hates people. He's a bitter person. And he lived it out with his cult and killed several people. Obviously rapists they're going to defile many around them, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Physically, emotionally. At the very beginning of our series, we looked at Adolf Hitler. When you study his childhood, as I shared last week, he was abused by a very domineering, violent father who beat him regularly. Adolf Hitler, in turn, would beat his little sister. So he was an angry man. He was a bitter man. And look what happened. He brought the whole world into war. Many were defiled. Millions upon millions suffered and died. Perhaps that's the epiphany or the epitome of this destructive spiral. But also, and this is scary, our offspring. Our offspring can be defiled because of our bitterness or because of our ancestors' bitterness, right? Scripture says in Exodus, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. This spirit can be passed on. Often, if someone is angry and bitter, it's because their ancestors were angry and bitter. We looked at this last week. Many times the way people hurt others, they've been hurt in the very same way. Child molesters. Almost 100% of them that have molested a child, they were molested. Uh, tests prove that. They're hurting others because they were hurt in that same way. And it's in a myriad of other ways of life. Another example would be all these ethnic fightings around the world. The Arab-Israeli conflict is one. Thousands of years of fight, uh, hatred, revenge, and killing. But all over the world. Sudan, Europe, Eastern Europe. You know, when they were in power, they abused the minority. Then that minority becomes in power, and so they take revenge and inflict pain and suffering on that ethnic group. That just doesn't happen overnight. That comes from ancestors. You know, some 
Some people groups are told and, and taught how to kill the other neighboring tribe or neighboring people. That defilement. How does this apply to us? This whole sequence and progression, I believe, may be Satan, Satan's greatest weapon to come to uh, steal, kill, and destroy based on John 10.10. And I'm definitely seeing this more and more in our ministry right here in the inner city. So, what does God tell us to do? Back in Hebrews 12, look diligently, lest any of you fail of the grace of God. Notice from this, whenever we are hurt or offended by someone, God immediately offers His grace to help us to forgive. But the trouble is, most people don't know that. But there it is in Scripture. God offers His grace, and it's only by God's grace that we can forgive someone that terribly hurts us. It's not humanly possible, I believe. But it's right there. It's like the electricity in this building. We have these outlets around the building here, around the room. There's electricity flowing through this building. But until we plug in a, an appliance or a fan or whatever it is, it does us no good. It's there. But we have to plug into it. That's, that's uh, how grace is. It's there. In fact, it's a gift, isn't it? Amen. James 4, 6. God gives more grace. But a gift has to be accepted before it becomes ours and Gifts can be refused. Gifts can be refused. Grace can be refused. And I can only think of two reasons why anyone would want to not have this grace. Only two reasons. Number one, they are ignorant of it. Even many Christians do not understand God's grace. In fact, I like that definition Bill Gothard has for grace. Now, some say it's unmerited favor, and, that, and that's part of it. But it's much more than that, and I like his definition. It's not only the uh, desire to do God's will, but it's the power. You can desire to do God's will all you want, but if you don't have the power, you will not do it, or I. But grace is both. Grace to live a forgiving, loving kind, sweet life. Too many Christians are going around angry and bitter, vengeful. Speaking about just Christians now. And we've all experienced it. But then there's another reason we may not receive that gift. It all comes back to pride. Again. Pride. Why? James 4, 6. God resists the proud, but he gives what? Grace, grace to the what? Humble. 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 He only gives grace to the humble. He does not give grace to the proud. Proud, because the proud says, I can do this. Or the proud says, I don't want to forgive. I enjoy drinking this poison. I enjoy hating that person because you don't know how much they hate me. No one else is going to punish them. I don't even think God's going to punish them. So I have to punish them in my thoughts or even worse in my actions. So once again, pride raises its ugly head. And once again, pride is the powerful obstruction to being delivered from this spiral of destruction. You see, pride often says it's the other person's fault that I'm like this. Now, they may be guilty of the initial abuse, the neglect, or the abandonment, but we are responsible for our response to that. Amen? Amen. Amen. God holds us responsible for how we react to people treating us. And going back to our original illustration, of being deeply hurt by someone in our early childhood, if we had been taught this, 
It's a powerful tool of forgiving our offender through God's grace. And this destructive spiral will have stopped right here. But again, for most of us, we were never taught why there's pain and how to deal with it. Because our parents didn't even know if they were even there. Well, this downward spiral of destruction uh, was set in motion. As we learned through Brother Tom Coster, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for a child to process and deal with this tremendous hurt in the correct way. Now, if you're hearing this powerful principle right now, and you desire complete deliverance and freedom from this bitterness that's rooted in unforgiveness because of past hurts, God's amazing grace, just like the song, God's amazing grace is available to you. But you must take it. He doesn't force it down our throats. It's a gift. And like any gift we, someone gives, we take. And all the grace you need to forgive whoever hurt you is available. God is bigger than that, amen? Amen. amen? amen. And He wants to give it to you. He doesn't want us to be enchained and inflicted with this. But there's only one condition to receive it. We must humble ourselves. That's our part. Now, I want to share with you this powerful diagram that we've learned from Bill Gothard's ministry. And it's entitled, How Persistent Bitterness and Unforgiveness Will Allow Satan to Gain Ground in Our Soul. How Persistent Bitterness and Unforgiveness Will Allow Satan to Gain Ground in Our Soul. And let me tell you this. If you're under the sound of my voice, Satan does not want you to understand what I'm going to share with you. He does not want you to understand this because he knows how powerful this is. Mr. Gothard illustrates it this way. Some of you have seen this before. This is going to be a picture of our soul. Now, when the Bible says our soul, it can mean mankind, people. But often it's talking about specifically our individual soul, which includes our mind, our will, and our emotions. Okay, our souls are made up of that. We're, we're three part people. We're physical, our body, we're spiritual, and then we're emotional, our soul. That's where our emotions come from. Everyone that's living has a soul. But it's also a way of thinking. Okay, when we're talking about the mind here, it's a way of thinking, and that's important to remember. Now, if we allow through unforgiveness, our refusing to forgive someone that hurts us, Scripture says that Satan builds a stronghold in our soul. How do we know this? Ephesians 4.27 In the context of not going to bed angry, God through the Apostle Paul says, do not give place to the devil. It's in that same context. Place in the Greek is the Greek word topos, and it means ground. Literal ground. 
You see, Satan wants to acquire ground in all of our souls. And he can do that, even in a, in a Christian's life. He can affect our mind, will, and emotions. He's always trying to do that. He wants to take more and more control of our mind, will, and emotions if, he, if we let him. But this only can happen as we surrender ground through persistent sin. And our example here is bitterness, unforgiveness. This actually becomes, and can become, a principality, illustrated by this umbrella. What's a principality? Ephesians 6.12. It's a ruler over evil, a ruler of evil over, over a jurisdictional area. Scripture says in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And Satan loves to have principalities in our lives. So this is the stronghold. Forgiveness. This area around we could call the surrendered ground. And scripture tells us, by the way. Bill Gothard, Jim Logan, Mark Bubeck, all very experienced in spiritual warfare. If you read their literature, and I would encourage you to read their literature, all very experienced in counseling and spiritual warfare, all of them explain that unforgiveness and thus bitterness is the number one sin that leads to demonic control person's life. The number one sin. So what happens next? Going back to Matthew 18, Jesus said, God gives us over to the tormentors. And this is what we'll spend time on in the weeks ahead, but what do these tormentors look like? Well, they can be fear. Unrealistic fear. Some fear is good, like if you're in danger and you need to run, that's good fear. Certainly anger. <laughs> Lust. Lust. Many bitter people are sexually immoral. The obvious, like rapists, child molesters, sodomites. Young women often become promiscuous because of a lack of a father in the home, whether he was there physically or maybe he was there physically but not there emotionally and didn't love his daughter. So in response to that, they look for love from a man or men in other ways because they crave that love, as we all do. So if they don't get it from a, he a loving father, they look otherwhere, other places, and other men. Same way with uh, sodomites. It's really just lack of love. That's why they're doing what they're doing. Of course, if a man becomes a male sodomite, especially because of a lack of a father in the home, and maybe a domineering mother, I don't know. There's different factors there. So, these, here's Satan with his principality of unforgiveness, building a stronghold, we're allowing him to do that, day after day, year after year, that we refuse to forgive someone, the root becomes deeper and deeper, the stronghold becomes stronger and stronger, and the tormentors, 
the torturers, because really these can torture someone, become greater and greater. And again, a stronghold is a way of thinking. Especially, a way of thinking. Getting back down to the soul again. The way we think. And Satan torments us with these emotions. These uh, bad emotions. These destructive emotions. God tells us, us in Scripture that He will turn us over to these tormentors if we do not forgive our offenders, Matthew 18, 34. If we try to fight the tormentors, Satan just simply retreats into this stronghold. In other words, if we try to address the symptoms and not get to the root, he just retreats for a little while until we kind of forget about him or the next issue comes up and then he attacks again. He attacks us in our mind, in our will, in our emotions. And until we deal with the root sin of unforgiveness, that's what we must deal with. But much more concerning this later. Throughout this study, I've shared with you that uh, the Lord is just emphasizing to me more and more, impressing upon my heart just how important righteous thinking is. You know, I, I knew this for years, but preparing for this study, the important of, importance of righteous thinking. Because if we're not thinking righteously, biblically, God's way, it can be so destructive. So destructive. Real quickly, let's look at some consequences in more detail. Another uh, torture can be depression. Depression. Depression is one of the most significant consequences of refusing to forgive the people who wrong us. Why? It requires emotional energy to maintain a grudge. Just as we become weary when our physical energy is exhausted, so we become depressed when our emotional energy is exhausted. Bitterness and resentment create an emotional focus toward the person who offended us. This focus is the chief cause of becoming just like the one we resent. The more we focus on his actions toward us, the more we resemble the basic attitudes which prompted his actions. We'll look at 1 John in more detail, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, but it says there that they that walk in unforgiveness and bitterness are walking in darkness. Hating someone brings confusion. According to Job 21-25, bitter people cannot enjoy life. There it says, even the, the food we eat, we do not taste and enjoy. A bitter person cannot enjoy his food because that bitterness even affects that. You know, we hear so much about chemical imbalance in the brain. How many here, if you're bold enough, have been diagnosed with chemical imbalance? <laughs> now, the diagnosis is correct. There is chemical imbalance in the brain brought on by these kind of emotions. But the treatment, i.e. giving of pills, or shock treatment, not many people do that these days, shock treatment, but they used to do shock treatments. You know, shock the brain so the person will forget. As we looked at earlier last week, you never really forget. Shock treatments cannot affect the soul. They can affect your brain, but they don't affect the soul. This is only treating the symptoms, fear, anger, depression. The pills only affect 
can affect the symptoms, but not the cause. But again, for many, it's unforgiveness and bitterness. And indeed, my 37 years of ministry in the inner city, including many that have been diagnosed psychotic, many are simply unforgiving and bitter. That's all. They're just simply unforgiving and bitter. Being bitter towards someone lowers our natural immune system, which fights illness and disease in our bodies. Colitis, toxic goiters, high blood pressure are only a few of the scores of diseases caused by bitterness. Our resentments call forth certain hormones from the pituitary, adrenal, and thyroid, and other glands. Excesses of these hormones cause the diseases in other parts of the body. That's a quote from this man, Dr. S.I. McMillan, MD. He wrote this book, None of These Diseases, based on what God said to the Jews. If you follow my ways, you will have none of the diseases the others around you have. You should get this book. It's an old book. Let me just read the back cover. The secret of health is found in the Bible. Medical science estimates that from 60 to nearly 100% of disease today is the result of emotional stress. Physicians can prescribe medicine for the symptoms of these diseases, but cannot, cannot do much for the underlying cause. Now a world-famous physician shares his most challenging medical discovery, that the teachings of the Bible can save modern man from today's most devastating diseases. This book, none of these diseases. He made the statement about chemical balance, imbalance. It affects our facial features. That's why ladies especially, you can't afford to be bitter because it makes you ugly. Refusing to forgive results in physical fatigue and loss of sleep. We may try to hide our resentments, but soon they will also be etched into our eyes, our facial muscles, as permanent reflections of our inward feelings. Bone health. The Bible has a lot to say about that. Leviticus, the life of the flesh is in the blood, but the factory for the blood is the marrow of our bones. The health of our bones therefore determines the health of our body. Bitterness has a direct and devastating effect upon our bones. In fact, look with me if you have your Bible. Turn to Proverbs. 17.22 A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. A broken spirit dries the bones. Osteoporosis. But that's, a, that's an emotional cause. A broken spirit. Depressed spirit. Depressed because we've been hurt. We have anointed many people with oil, the elders, over the years. And 95% uh, of the people we've anointed, they've come for a physical issue. But as we talk with them and pray with them, we find out it's an emotional problem. And once that is cleared up, the physical problem is cleared up. Years ago, a man came to us. He still attends Division Street. He says to me, Pastor Daniel, pray for my arm. I just, I got this sore arm. And I don't know what caused it. And I found out, you know, did, well, did you sleep on it wrong? Or did you bump it or hurt it? No, can't remember that. I was just prompted to ask him, are you angry with anyone? He said, well, matter of fact, yes. I said, when did it start hurting? When I got angry at that person. I said, forgive the person in your heart. See what happens. Saw so him the next week, he said, the pain's all gone. The pain in his arm was because he was bitter. Don't ask me to explain it, but that's what Scripture teaches. 
So many Christians, I believe, are suffering needlessly, emotionally, physically, and especially spiritually, because of this. I mentioned this book last week from Bill Godfrey, How to Resolve Seven Deadly Stresses. Look at this book if you want, after the service. This is my copy, don't take it. <laughs> but you can look at it, and you can order those, if you want. This bitterness, it's, uh, it's terrible. Certainly the spiritual consequences are great. It's, it takes away our ability to love God. As we saw earlier, we get angry at God. Scripture says in 1 John, if a man says, says he loves God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He that loves not his brother by not forgiving them, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This commandment have we from him that he loves God. He who loves God loves his brother also. But much more on this in the weeks ahead. We talked about how this leads to doubts of salvation. Because of what Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. If we refuse to forgive other people, we are actually asking God not to forgive us. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Bitterness even leads to the inability to worship God. Look at Matthew 5, 20 through 25 in your own time. Jesus says, if you come to the altar there, and there remember that thy brother has anything against thee, leave there thy gift and go thy way, and first be reconciled unto thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. So we can't even worship the Lord in the right way. I made a copy of uh, just the consequences of bitterness, physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental. If you want one of these after the service, with accompanying scripture, help yourself. Stomach ulcers may be painful tormentors that result from bitterness we allow by refusing to forgive. The stress of bitterness decreases alkaline secretions that protect the stomach lining at the same time increasing gastric secretions, which cause damage to the lining. Case study. My parents promised that when I reached the legal age, they would let me get, get my driver's license. When they broke their promise, I became bitter. Soon I developed stomach ulcers. I lost so much blood that I passed out and had to be hospitalized three different times. When I learned how my bitterness was causing my stomach ulcers, I asked my parents to forgive me. There is now no more anger, bitterness, or ulcers. He didn't need medication. He didn't need a surgery. He needed to forgive. One of the most common oper operations today is the removal of the gallbladder. The removal of the gallbladder, though, can result in serious unexpected complications. Stress slows down the gallbladder's effectiveness in eliminating toxins, which can lead to the formation of gallstones. Starvation and obesity have the same root problem. Did you know that? People that are overweight and people that are starving have the same root problem. A lack of nutritious food to keep the body healthy. Bitterness produces stress which upsets the hormonal balance and increases the level of cortisol. This decreases the hormone production in the thyroid and stimulates the appetite resulting in obesity. So I could go on and on. These are just a few illustrations. Well, again, you may ask, uh, Daniel, why are you so negative? Why all this time spent on unforgiveness, bitterness, anger? I, I want to share this because we need to understand the depths and the severity of this wickedness and the destructive consequences before we can receive the deliverance and genuine freedom. If you go to a surgeon for cancer, to remove a cancerous tumor, 
they must go through a myriad of tests, right? Right. You want them to do that. So they know where the cancer is. Amen? Amen. Oh, we'll cut open your leg. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not there. Let's go to your arm. Oh, we're sorry, it's not there. So they just keep, you know, that doesn't work, right? Tests. X-rays. Same with your automobile mechanic. You want to take it to a person that knows what he's doing. And it may take time. Put it on the computer, find out what the problem is. That's why we need to spend time on this. Let me close. Night after night for three years, Jamil endured the same abuse. Different groups of men, leaders of a local Islamist group, came to his home and took turns beating him up. They punched him, they slapped him, they kicked him. Their hatred inflamed by drunkenness. In their eyes, he was a kafir or infidel. In a small Central Asian village, he was leading others away from Islam. You see, Jamil was raised in a moderate Muslim family. His older brother adopted more radical beliefs while serving a prison sentence. Jamil's curiosity, though, was piqued by his brother's views, so he began his own search for spiritual truth. During his studies, he met Christians who shared the gospel with him. Jamil knew he had found the true, one true God, and he turned his back on Islam for good. He immediately began sharing the gospel, leading his Islamist brother to Christ, as well as three other siblings. He planted four house churches before his church sent him as a missionary to a village composed entirely of Muslims. His, uh, Jamil shared the gospel, and he worked to support his family. News of his Christian faith spread quickly among the villagers, and they soon decided that he had to be stopped. That's when the nightly beatings began. They couldn't allow this, these kafirs in their village. He took these nightly beatings, night after night after night, and always responded as a Christian until they came and beat up his six-year-old son. Then as the story goes on to say, then he lost it. He became angry. So he actually took a knife, went to one of these men's homes, burst into the house, all intents and purposes to kill one of these men that beat up his son. And the son's father was there and he says, Jamil, why are you here? And why do you have that knife? I want to kill your son. Jamil, this is not like you. We thought you were a Christian. And at that moment he was convicted. And he went out, cried out to God for forgiveness for that anger, bitterness, destructive revenge and forgave his attackers. Well, they kept coming back to beat him up. One night they all came in. They said, we're hungry. We want your wife to prepare a meal for us. His wife looked at him like, should I? He said, go ahead. So his wife prepared a meal for the guys that were about to beat him up. Finally, one of them said, why are you doing this? Why are you feeding us and we're going to beat you up? He said, it's because of Christ. Soon, one or more of these came to Christ for salvation because of his testimony. Now, did he have a reason to be angry? In the eyes of the world, he did. To be bitter, yes. To take revenge, yes. But God said, no, that's not my way. Forgive, love, and show Christ to them. And that was the result. Well, again, perhaps you're here or under the sound of my voice and you're dealing with this. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end of the series <laughs> to get right with the Lord. You can do it right now, right where you're sitting, by simply receiving God's grace, humbling yourself first, receiving your God's grace and saying, I want to forgive those that have hurt me. And again, you may be arguing in your spirit, you don't know how they hurt me. I don't, but God does. God does. And you can keep drinking this poison. You can keep drinking this poison.
and you're only harming yourself. The person you hate, the person you can't forgive, they may even be deceased. Your hatred is not going to touch them. Maybe this person is living on the other side of the continent. They don't even know you're angry at them. You're not hurting them. You're hurting yourself. And maybe you have physical problems because of that, let alone the emotional and the spiritual. Forgive. Oh, I know it's difficult. It's impossible. But not with God, right? right. Mm -hmm. All right. things are possible. And if he tells us over and over and over again, forgive, do not hold a grudge, don't go to bed angry, it means it's possible. God would not tell us to do something that's not possible. But again, it takes humility, first of all. It takes humility to say, yes, I've been wrong. I have been living in sin by refusing to forgive that person. But let's stop right now. Let's stop this downward spiral. Because we're going to see in upcoming weeks, it gets more and more sinister. We've only touched the surface. It gets really bad, as this series will reveal. Heavenly Father, uh, Thank you for your word. Lord, sometimes your word kind of slaps us in the face. But that's what it, sometimes it's there for. All scripture is given by God for reproof and correction and righteousness. Father, if there's anyone here or under the sound of my voice that right now wants to forgive, even the most painful hurt or offense. Lord, may they just obey you, receive the grace, forgive even though they don't feel like it, even though it's a struggle. But then, Lord, I pray that as they do that, they would taste and see that you are good. Even just a little taste of the relief and the joy and the peace that will come through this forgiveness. With every head bowed and every eye closed again, no looking around, is there anyone here within the church today that just wants me to pray for them by them raising their hands, saying, you know, Lord, and, and Daniel, I, I want to forgive. I, I need grace to forgive. Just raise your hand up and then down. Thank you. Praise God. Anyone else? Oh, Lord, help these individuals that raise their hand, that are showing evidence, signs that they want to change. Help them, Lord, give them grace, and may they receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's take a hymn book.